So now we're actually ready to, to start looking into the language itself a little bit. Um, what I thought I'd do is sort of talk you through a little bit about the sort of main data structures and, and just the very fundamentals. So bear with me, it's going to be very basic from the start and we're going to build up from this. Now, <coughs> this, this, the language itself is very, very simple. The, the, it, 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 it effectively um, just consists of nested lists. So if I type something here, uh, I can there's a keyboard shortcut that allows me to, to work in a way where I can evaluate things interactively. So I can just sort of like do that, uh, and it will evaluate and put, print the result here. Uh, now, that didn't work because we haven't actually executed this top bit here, and we need to do that before anything else works. This, there's nothing executed from this file yet. So the first thing I need to do is sort of evaluate this bit. Uh, which sort of creates a namespace for me to work inside. If I don't have a namespace, I don't have access to any of the standard functions that are uh, sort of shipped with the language. I can't do anything until I have a namespace. Um, and this bit here sort of evaluates and creates a namespace called tutorial.fundamentals. Uh, I'm now sort of evaluating this function here, and you can see that I get the result directly here. Um, so the language essentially consists of these lists, which is just a parenthesis around something. And the first part of the expression is a function call uh, or, a, or, a, or a named function. And the rest of it is arguments to that function. So I can add additional arguments here. I can print 3 and 5 as well. And if I evaluate that, I get more function, um, arguments piped into. So yeah, it's, it's, it, it is Lisp syntax. That's, that's what it is. I was sort of just assuming that, you know, I don't want to assume that anyone knows what Lisp syntax is. So I'm, it is, yes, that's what, what it's called. And the way you would do this, if you, if you wanted to sort of nest multiple arguments, you would put an additional list in here. So I print hello there, and I can sort of add uh, uh, another command, another uh, evaluation in here. So we get hello and five, and I guess I could do like a read, so read something from disk here. I'm just going to type something, US, USR, share. Uh, there we go. So there we go. Um, now, reading from disk is called slurp. Writing to disk is called spit. <laughs> and this is so you know that these are disgusting things that you shouldn't be doing should avoid it. Um, but uh, if we look at this closely, we, we're, we're calling the print line function with three arguments. The first argument is the string hello, literal string. The second argument is the result of evaluating uh, this function, which is just adding two to three. And the third argument is the result of reading uh, the string, uh, reading as the, the, the file specified here as a string. Uh, this, is a, this is a file that ships with uh, basically every Unix machine. It's a bunch of words that are connectives that should be put between other words. There's stuff like that that might be useful for this demonstration. Um, now, you will notice at the end of this, it will sort of put a little arrow here and say nil. And that means that this expression, this entire expression, actually evaluated to nil. So the thing that it printed out, that's sort of a side effect. And it didn't actually return something good from that. Um, all right. So you've seen strings, you've seen numbers, and you've seen function calls, basically. There's a bunch of other stuff that you can use to put in. Uh, I think they're called literals, basically. Like, uh, there's a literal called nil, <laughs> which is exactly like Java null. That's what it is. Um, so if you want to type null, you type nil, because uh, this is a language that has taken a lot of cues from Lisp, and Lisp called null nil. So it's here as well. You have true and false, of course. Uh, these are all, all also from the same thing. Like if, it, if you put true in here, it will evaluate to Java true, of course. Um, you can do like character literals. So that's if I wanted uh, just a single character, I can do like slash h. I can do like slash, um, you know, another letter, um, 
And if I wanted some more like complex character, like a tab or a space, that's actually typed out like this. So these are individual characters. Um, uh, there's uh, a regular expression literal, which is like a string, but you prefix it with a hash. And if you do that, that evaluates to, oh, that didn't help, really help us a lot, but it evaluates to uh, the type of that thing. It becomes a Java util regex pattern. So it sort of compiles that into a compi compiled regex, and you can use that to, to do that sort of stuff if you want to do. Um, there is something called keywords, which look like this. You do a colon, and then you do like uh, something like that. So that's a key. Maybe you call it like name. Uh, so that's a good example of a key. And uh, this is a, a keyword. And a keyword is uh, a very useful thing. Essentially, it's, it is like a string. But it's a string that, when you compile it, it will only be a single instance of that string. You don't get like multiple, you don't, you don't, it doesn't, doesn't actually run string new on it a bunch of times. And it doesn't create garbage. It just like becomes a string that's inlined into the, the application. And every time, in every source file where you type the same string, it will share the same you know, space of characters in the compile, compile the result. Uh, these are very often used for um, lookups into, into maps, like if you use map keys and want to have like properties and stuff. That, and uh, you, can, you can include upper and lowercase letters and numbers, and you can also include dashes and question marks if you want to do, and plus and stuff. Like, there's very little limits about what you can name stuff in this, because there's, not, there's nothing special about the syntax. You, you don't have a bunch of, of reserved operators and stuff like that. Everything is functions, and it's just because of this very simple syntax, you, you can name things pretty much how you, how you like to. Now, um, it also includes um, very simple uh, literals for vectors like this. So this is a vector literal. It will just, you know, it creates a vector that contains these elements. Um, you have a similar hash map literal, where you do like a one, b two. So that's a that's a map where we have two keywords, like two keys. We have the key a, value one, key b, value two, um, and the comma here is just here for clarity. It's actually optional. I don't need that. Commas are effectively treated as white space enclosure. And a lot of the time, this was really sort of annoying to me at first. But after I started using it for a bit, I was like, I don't really need that. And I don't even I don't put them in anymore. But they might be useful for clarity purposes some, sometimes. And you can see that if I evaluate this, it will actually print a comma between it in, in the output here just to sort of Make it a bit more clear, but you know, I might not remember to put them in. Uh, you can see the same thing here with the with the vector. I can do it like that, but I don't need them. The space separates the elements. Um, there's a set literal, so this is a set of the items A and B, and um, what that would do is you can see that it appears here. It doesn't appear in the same order that I typed them because it's not sorted. It just like contains these items. And that's very useful if you want to sort of determine if something contains, if something is taken or something like that. Um, and the final thing I want to talk about is the list literal, which is the same thing that we typed here that actually resulted in a function evaluating. Um, I can have a list that is not evaluated, but I have to put a little quote character in front of it because I, ne I need to tell the compiler to not treat this as a function call. If I evaluate this, I get a list back with the contents one, two, three. But if I don't put that quote character in there, uh, it will try to sort of call because it sort of it can't distinguish this from a function, so it will try to call the function that's on the number one, but there isn't one. Like That's not a function, that's a number. So you get a class ca cast ex exception from that. So I need to put that little quote in there to, to sort of tell the uh, to reader to ignore that bit. 
Uh, you might see these appear from time to time whenever lists are in, in, in the code. Um, now, we're in our namespace here. Uh, but you can, of course, create modules and different namespaces. And if you wanted to include uh, another namespace, you can do so. So here I'm going to include the string namespace or the string module. And there's a function called uppercase. And we do hello. And now it's going to say uh, no such namespace string. And that's because I haven't actually included it yet. Uh, and in order to include it, I need to require it. So I go to the namespace definition here, and I put in like require. There we go. Uh, I need to include require string, and I will create an alias for it called string that I can use locally here. Now, if I don't put this bin, bit, bit in, I can just require this module up here, which will cause it to be loaded. And I can use this full name to refer to this module. So I could put like that. But instead, I wanted to sort of create an alias for it, so I don't have to type that much every time. So you just do the, basically, there's, the convention is that you typically do like you name it the same thing as the namespace. So you maybe just, you could do like an S there if you wanted to to make it even shorter. Uh, but yeah, I like the long ones. I like to type. Um, all right, so that's a function. And of course, we need to reload the entire file. There we go. Um, so that's how you require stuff from other modules. Now, if I wanted to define a symbol in my module that someone else could require, I would use def. So def defines something as a name. Uh, and what we're going to do is uh, define a basically a, a variable or a constant, which I'm going to call names. And I'm going to define it like that, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to slurp, I'm going to slurp a list of names that's also available in this um, somewhere here. Uh, let's see. Oh, it's called proper names. And if I'm just going to first evaluate that, remember I can type into this at any point. And uh, actually, before I do that, I need to I need to switch the namespace because I think right now um, when I when you start a REPL, it starts up. Uh, it starts evaluating stuff in the namespace that is the main namespace of the application. And if you want to evaluate something inside another namespace, you need to switch the namespace of the REPL to that namespace. So you can do that from the context menu. You can do like REPL. Uh, oh, sorry, misclicked there. Uh, and you can do switch REPL NS to current file. And this is something that I really recommend you put into a keyboard shortcut. So you can do it just by pressing a key combination, because you will be doing that a lot if you're working in Clojure. Uh, now I can probably look at this names list here. And you can see it's a very long string with a bunch of names in it. Uh, now I want to not have this as a list of string. I, I, I don't want it as a, as a string. I want it as a list of names. So I'm going to call, um, I think it's like Ring. Split lines. So I'm going to feed that function into split lines. And it will now be a vector of strings. So this define here has defined this name. And I can use that from another module now. Just like this one, I will require in closure string a string. Uh, someone else could require um, this fundamentals thing and refer to names. This is public, so it's available to everyone. If I wanted to make this private so no one can see it in this module, I would put like private before that. Now it's not available from outside. Only this module can see it. But why would we prevent them from doing that? Right. 
uh, OK, so that's how you define something. Um, we talked about putting something private as well. Now, the little thing that you saw me do there, I put a like, little hat, a colon, and private. What this essentially does is that this is creates uh, metadata for the compiler to read. And you put a metadata tag before something that you want to affect. So you put it like that. It, so this will affect the next thing. It will make uh, names private. Um, so we we defined uh, we defined a, a, a constant that contains a list of names. Uh, we can also define functions, and that would do the same thing. Like if we, if we were to define a function, I would define and I would put a name. Let's call this mango. We're gonna do a function that mangles some stuff, um, and I can just bind that to a function that takes an argument and does something. String. I'm just going to join the string. Uh, string. Go. Eh. Yeah. OK. So I, this defines a function, it, or rather, it defines um, a symbol that is bound to a function. The function takes a string. Uh, the string is given as an argument to the string reverse function. Um, and the reversed string is then joined together with dashes. Uh, da, 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 da. Sting. Sting. Where is it? There we go. Thank you. And of course, this um, because I have this uh, REPL connection, I can evaluate this function. I can try it out. So I just wa want to mangle hello. And it will reverse it and put the dashes in between. So this is a really nice way of working with you can, you can sort of try functions out and sort of see what they're doing. And you can also sort of try to break them. What ha happens if I put nil in here? Oh, there's a null pointer exception. Boo. Uh, and then I could sort of fix my function to, to, to support that, but if I wanted to. Now, uh, this is a very, very common thing to do, like doing a def and then defining a function like this that takes an argument. It's so common that there's a shorthand for it called defin, which basically lets you take this bit here uh, and Define, you know, you put the you put the argument directly after, and you you get a function back that. Oh, we, I actually need to put a name in as so well. Mango. Um, I'm gonna put a bunch of line breaks here so I can scroll up a little bit. There we go. Um, okay, so let's uh, actually do our demangle function that would sort of take a mangle string. Uh, and demangle it. So what would we need to do? We need to remove the uh, dashes, I guess, and then reverse it again. So that's, um, I guess, replace the mangle string. Uh, I remove these and put in empty strings. And I would string reverse it, probably. Maybe. Let's try it out, I guess. We mangled hello. What if we demangle it? A maze. So that works. Um, so, so typically, you would use defn like this. And again, if you wanted to make it private, there's a shorthand for that as well. You can put in a dash there. That means that there will be a private function. So you don't have to do that. You could do that, or you could do the thing that I showed about with the private, like that. Um, but typically, a dash is less code, so that's preferred. Um, now, 
a lot of the time you will write a function like this. You wouldn't want to write something complicated like this. I haven't really done a lot here. So I just sort of take the result of one function and pipe it into to another function. But a lot of the time you would do more stuff. So uh, if, if that's the case, uh, typically we, you would do a let construct. So let's do another function. Uh, let's do a function that determines if a word is a palindrome. I'm going to call it palindrome question mark. So this is a convention that you typically do is like you put um, question mark to sort of signify that this will return a boolean value. Uh, it will take something and return a boolean value. It takes a word and it will return true if this is a palindrome. Um, I'm going to use a, fun uh, a construct called let here to create some temporary variables that are available just inside this scope. Uh, so in order to determine if something is a palindrome, we need to see if it's the same reversed as non-reversed. But we should probably make it lowercase first to make the comparison easier. So let's do a lowercase version of the word. So you can see I'm, I'm now running the string lowercase function on the word. and I will have the result of that evaluation as lowercase here. And I can refer to lowercase from this point out, out, uh, down, uh, onward. Uh, and we do another one where we reverse it. The string reverse the lowercase word, right? And if the reversed string is equal to the lowercase version, then it's a palindrome. You with me? Um, and I guess we'll try to. You guys know any palindromes? Kayak. It's a palindrome. And if I put a capital letter on there, it will still work. And if I put something that's not a palindrome, it will tell me it's not a palindrome. So th that worked. So you will use let a lot like this. And you can just sort of list additional stuff. Just keep going here. Um, and you can also, uh, the, the idea with the let is that um, these, these are available um, everywhere inside the let mark here. Now you can see the, I don't know if you see this very well, but there's a, there's a paren here and a paren there, the red ones there. So that's the scope of these bindings. If I'm here, Outside of that, I don't actually, I can't, I can't use these anymore. They're not, they're undefined. And what you also what, uh, would want to know is that this will shadow any um, variables from the outer scope. So if I put uh, another uh, binding here called word, uh, this would shadow word from here inside this let statement, but Outside this let statement, word is still the thing that entered the function. So it just covers that up. Right. Um, la la la, yes, talked about that. Now, we did, a, we did a thing here where you sort of compared stuff. And um, like everything is essentially the same thing. Everything is just. Um, a list that is a function call, and you put something at the beginning of that, and you put the arguments. So the the equals sign here is actually a function called equals. It it is a function that takes a bunch of arguments, and uh, just evaluates them. And there's you know it might look look a bit weird, but the nice thing about it is that you can actually put additional things in here. So you can so but like. You can, you can say, oh, this actually only evaluates to true if everything is equals inside this, this thing, right? Um, but yeah, that, that's about the gist of it. And I can, you know, I, there's, no, there's nothing preventing me from defining my own operators like this. If I wanted to, I, I, could, I could have defined equals myself. I could define a, a double equals if I wanted that one. You know, if I wanted to create a function, I would just put like fn like that. That's defining a function that's named double equals. Um, if I wanted to open that whole can of worms. Now, talking about equality, uh, a really nice thing. With what yeah. happens if you define something that's already available? 
then from that point on and uh, below that it will have the new so you override everything there. yeah you, 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 and this is this is actually used a lot I mean if I if I if I type something in here and I put a bug in here maybe I sort of like oh, I put uh, I screw, screwed up my mangle function here so it uh, it will mangle stuff with uh, uh, with a dash instead and now you know demangle doesn't work properly because I screwed up the, the, the mangle function what I what I did here I was actually sort of executing this bit again and that would sort of overwrite the previous definition of it so, so it's uh, something that you typically do during development. You, you rerun stuff to, to provide new definitions and, and you know, fix, fix bugs and stuff like that. Um, but it can bite you. It, it ha you know, just last week, it actually uh, we, 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 we tripped on this a bit because we had a, a long source file where someone would, would define something up here and then at the very low point below the f that, they would redefine it with something else. So we cover that up with a new definition and that meant that every piece of code that was between those two would use the previous definition and then everything that sort of uh, required that file would have the later definition uh, and you know it can happen um, you need to kind of watch out for that it really helps here because I'm using when I'm using cursive it will sort of show me you see these are sort of um, dimmed a little bit that means that they're not used so I can see that the definition hasn't been used anywhere, and I can see that you know I don't. Uh, that's probably weird. If I have a function that's defined that's not used by anything. Uh, question: You're yes. defining uh, functions at the top level in this file. Yeah. Can you define functions inside the scope of a different, like local functions, basically? Yes, you can. I mean, you saw here when I defined when I defined mangle here, I just put this bit. I defined mangle and I put a function in there. So what I would do is I would put I could put something like this in a let statement, my fun, uh, and that would actually allow me to put a function inside the let statement here, a local function. And um, we'll talk a bit more about uh, functions and and how they act uh, a bit later. Uh, 